Oh, can we have some mic? Sorry, Paul. Welcome, everyone. Do take your seats. We're about to start in just a minute. Okay, let's uh, gather, shall we? Uh, and let's begin. Hang on, talk about yourselves. We've already got a technical problem, so I'll just hope it's all. Well, that was easy. Good. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's lovely to see you here. We are a bit short of number. It's summer, and now what, what happens, but it is lovely to gather uh, and to you online as well uh, welcome uh, if you are new or visiting i'm john i'm one of the ministers here the, the leaders of the church um, and you're especially welcome everything's going to be up on the screen uh, it's very easy to follow uh, and as always let's have a moment of quiet shall we a chance just to gather our thoughts before the lord to process before him perhaps today so that we might by his grace be focused upon him and that we would benefit and worship truly. So a moment of quiet for your own prayers. Let's draw our prayers together, shall we, in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours forever and ever. Amen. Let's remain in prayer. Just hear these words from Psalm 34 that says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. And Father, as we gather this afternoon, we praise you for your goodness. We praise you that you are good in and of yourself, even before creation or salvation. But in all eternity, you are utter holiness and purity, and righteousness, and wisdom. 
But we thank you that in creation and salvation, you've made your goodness known in the natural world around us, but most supremely in the gift of your son for us. We thank you that there in him, we see your glory displayed like in a mirror. We thank you that in his death on the cross, we see at the depths of your commitment to justice and your desire for mercy. And so as we gather this afternoon, we say that we have tasted and we have seen that you, O oh Lord, are good. And we are blessed to have taken refuge in you. So please, O oh God, would you meet with us this afternoon? Would you draw from us sincere praise and prayer and attentiveness? Would you speak to us? Would you meet with us as well as we gather in the Lord's Supper? And would you strengthen us? in our service of you, our Father in heaven this week. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, musicians are going to come up and we're going to sing uh, Love Divine. And uh, it's a song that speaks of God changing us from glory into glory. And that's what we'll be thinking about as adults later on, that process of renewal or glorification. Let's stand, shall we, uh, and celebrate God's love for us. Take your seats, please, everyone. As always, we have a, a kid's thought, and we're thinking about big words for big God. And it's quite an interesting one today, in that the truth is that God is happy. God is happy. He delights uh, simply in being God. Now, Maggie's going to come and read to us uh, to help us into this. Where are you, Maggie? Well done. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of Kings, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Thank you so much. Well done. Well read. Yeah, let's give a round of applause. Now, let's just think about this for a moment, shall we? Kids, if you say, I feel really blessed, what do you mean? 
You say, I feel really blessed today. What do you mean? Yeah. Loved. Nice. Okay. So you feel loved. What else might you mean if you say, I feel really blessed? Yeah. Happy. That's good. Anything else? Yeah. Special. Thank you. Yeah. It's a happy word, isn't it? It's a happy word to, to, to speak of how actually you feel, you know, special and loved. Yeah. So what sort of things might make you feel blessed? What might make you feel blessed today? Yeah. Family. Nice one. Well done. Lots of brownie points there. Anything else make you feel blessed today? Adults, anything? Yeah, go on. Friends, thank you. Yeah, feel ya. Food, thank you. Anything that doesn't begin with F? <laughs> Sunshine, okay. There's lots to feel blessed in, aren't there? Well, look, God feels blessed all the time. He, Yes, we know he sometimes gets angry with people and is sad to see people suffer. But there's always a sense, because he always knows that he's doing right and he always knows what's going on, there's a sense that in himself he's still always content, he's always happy, he's always satisfied, he's always blessed. And because he's unlike us, he can be constantly happy in himself, even while he is concerned about things that go on in the world. Now, why does that matter, do you think, to think that God is always happy in himself and blessed? Well, there's two reasons why it matters. The first is it means that God can't be forced to do stuff he doesn't want to do. Uh, I know that if I'm feeling really sad and unhappy and someone promises that actually I can be happy if I do something, I'm quite likely to do it. But because God is always happy in himself, no one can make him do anything uh, other than what he wants to do. The second thing is it means that we, um, we find our greatest happiness in God as well. You see, God desires to share his blessedness. And he's made this world and he's made us so that we could share in it forever, so that we could be blessed too, which is really amazing, isn't it? Now, kids, what about God makes you happy we've talked about stuff outside like the friends and the food and stuff what about god makes you happy yes that he loves you brilliant that makes me happy as well yes he cares for you that's a really good thing to make you happy anyone got any other things that uh, is about god that makes you happy yes ezra uh, i get it yeah so god makes us happy uh, and that's a great thing to be happy in him about, isn't it? Yeah. What about God makes you happy? What's that? I, he's blessed this. He blesses you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. He does. I can't hear you from over here. That's brilliant. Yeah. Who else? Yes. He cares about you. All those things, don't they? They make us happy. Well, God is always happy in himself and he desires to share that happiness with others. Isn't that a great truth to think about? today well one of the things uh that uh, make us happy that come from god is kids at four um but it's a bit different today because it's august so all the kids minis youngers and olders are all going to go out in a moment um and many kids are going to continue as normal but younger and older kids you're going to get to watch a dvd uh in these weeks during august okay and i think you're watching the lego movie or something today all right so let's bow our heads Let's say a prayer for you all. Pray home this great truth that God is happy in himself. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you share your blessedness with us. But we're even more delighted to know that you are blessed in yourself. That you are content and unmovable uh, in all that you desire and do. And Father, we know that you take delight in those you have brought to know you through your son. And then we know that you are always in that sense happy, even though you can sometimes be displeased with us. We pray that we would be a joy to you, just as you are a joy to each of us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now could you walk up slowly, kids? And parents, could you take them up if they're in mini kids or younger kids and make sure... They're all signed in properly. Thank you.
As they're doing that, let's turn to one another and let's say hello and greet each other in the Lord and see how we're getting on. Okay, I think we can run through some notices while people are up there because they're not really going to miss much. There's not really much going on uh, in, the, in the church actually during the summer because it's a time everyone's away. But what we always say is make the most of the time to just spend time with people. Um, it was lovely a few of us got together to just hang out a bit with the church today. But why not think actually this is a great time to be getting your neighbours round and getting to know the people that live on your street uh, or getting some people from church round that you've been longing to for a while. Um, do make the most uh, of the summer. It does mean that there are no formal groups meeting over the next few weeks, but if you are in need, uh, please do uh, get in touch with me. Um, I'm here for this week and then Tom Bourne is back uh, from next weekend and he'll be around as well. So the fact that we don't have groups doesn't mean there's no one there for you. Just let us know um, and we'd be very happy to meet up for coffee uh, and spend some time with you. I think the only other thing I wanted to say was that um, many of us were at the weekend away, which PJ uh, spoke at. Um, I was at his son's wedding yesterday. Um, so bring greetings to you all from Horam. Uh, it was a really delightful time where Orlando, who's a lovely Christian young man of 20, marrying a lovely Christian girl. Um, and it was one of those weddings that is just such a joy to see, really. Um, so greetings to you all from Horam. Well, Rob Bannister is going to come and lead us in some prayers before we sing again. So let's bow our heads, shall we, uh, as we pray. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come before you, the great God of heaven and earth. We thank you that you are a gracious God and that you will hear our prayers and answer in accordance with your sovereign will and purposes. And we just ask, Lord, as we come now that uh, you would indeed draw close to us and help us to pray with one heart and mind as we uh, lift up our voices before you. We thank you that you are a merciful God. We thank you that you are long suffering and uh, you look down upon us in mercy. We praise you for uh, your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and for the salvation that we have in him. And we thank you, Lord, that uh, uh, even though we fail and uh, our hearts go astray, we thank you that you are faithful and uh, you keep us and you have your hand upon us. So, Heavenly Father, as we uh, worship you, we, we pray, Lord, that you would um, be with all those who are on holiday at this time, many of us away. We ask that you bless them. Uh, we pray that the families that, uh, that are away may have some really happy times together. Uh, create some lovely memories, but we pray, Lord, that you would draw near to them, that they might know your presence and that they might uh, spend this time together uh, loving you, worshipping you, sharing around your, your truth together. We pray, Lord, that you would give uh, all of us as we have holidays over these weeks uh, some rest, uh, some uh, opportunity to recuperate and feel refreshed again for the new term when that all starts. So, Lord, be with us, your people, and with your people wherever they are, we ask over the coming weeks. We thank you for the, the lovely weather and the opportunity to enjoy creation all around about us. We ask that we might ever be mindful of uh, your sovereignty and uh, your power uh, that is evident all around about us. Lord, we thank you that Judah is now out of hospital, and uh, we just pray, Lord, that you would bless him and help him to recover quickly and, uh, and guide those who uh, continue to make decisions about any care or checks that uh, are necessary. Lord, we just pray that you would watch over him. Uh, and uh, we ask too that you would be with Adele and Paul as they, uh, as they 
uh, bring up that that little family have your hand upon them be with them we pray we ask that you would also provide a, a new carer for adele that you would uh bring about uh, the right person somebody who even uh, loves you and uh, and loves your ways we pray lord that you would provide for them uh, in that way lord in the news we've been hearing about um young archie battersby and uh his life support machine being switched off yesterday and the family losing him lord, we would pray for that family we ask lord that you would comfort them uh that you would use these sad and uh and difficult circumstances to draw them close to you we pray that you'd have your hand upon them and uh, we ask lord that uh, you would uh, speak into that family situation we pray, Lord, for the different holidays and holiday clubs uh, that are organized around the country, the beach missions, the different opportunities to share your truth. And we just ask that you would be with all those who are involved in those things, that you'd really energize them, that you would give them that zeal to proclaim your truths. And we pray, Lord, that uh, over this period that you would really do a great work amongst youngsters and adults alike, that you might turn people to yourself. Lord, at a national level, we would pray for uh, our future prime minister and ask again that your will might be done here on earth as it is in heaven, that you would have your way and uh, the future prime minister of the UK might be uh, that which you have elected. We pray, Lord, that uh, whoever that might be, they might be uh, tolerant of your ways and, and seek uh, law that is righteous and true. And we pray, Lord, that you would uh, use them for your great honor and your purposes. We pray further afield as well. The, the Ukraine has, has disappeared from our news, yet we know, Lord, that there is much trouble there still. There is still war. Uh, and we just ask that you would, uh, that you would bring about a solution to this, uh, to this war, that you would cause there to be a swift end, and that you would uh, quickly enable those Ukrainian dispersed uh, people to, to return home and begin to re-establish that country. So Lord, we pray for the Christians who are supporting in all those things and ask that you would, uh, that you would uh, go before them and uh, that they might be salt and light in the lives of those that they're spending time with. So Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to, to meet around your word this afternoon. We pray that you would be with John and bless him as he opens up your truth and as we share your truth again this afternoon we ask that you would speak into our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit and that you would nourish us and set it up set us up for the week ahead we pray these things in Jesus name and for his sake amen yeah so musicians will come up now we're going to sing a couple of songs if you weren't with us last week we thought about uh, a Bible word called redemption, which means that at the cost of Christ's own death on the cross, we're purchased for God. We're brought out uh, from being slaves to all the wrongdoing of this world. And we're freed, uh, freed to use our freedom to serve the living God, to find joy in him. And we're going to sing of that now with two songs, Rescuer, uh, and this is Amazing Grace. So let's stand and celebrate, shall we? <laughs> We are free from sin forevermore. 
while we stand, let's respond, shall we? It may be something that you've heard God speak to you about through this sermon series. It may be something else that he brings to mind. But let us respond in praise and prayer and thanksgiving. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Thank you, Lord. For those who seek your righteousness, you have filled them up. You have given them your righteousness. You have saved us. You have We thank you for all you have done for us. And for all you have made us for those who seek you. Amen. Amen. Oh, man. Father, for all that we've been thinking about in the last weeks, and the sun up and even in the sun that we've been singing, we just bring up those two words in the last song, which is called, This is amazing, this is wonderful, blessed be Amen. Father, we do thank you that by your grace you speak to us. You haven't left us to work things out for ourselves. And so as the Bible is now read, and then I preach to us, Lord, would you speak? Help me, Father, to be clear and faithful. And for all as we listen, that we'd be humble and receptive, that we would experience that word of life doing its work within us, renewing us from glory into glory. And Father, we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, please do take a seat. So Ruben's going to come and read to us our Old Testament reading from Isaiah 61, uh, 1 to 6. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has, set, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness from the prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of spirit and despair. Instead of spirit and despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, planting of the Lord, for the, for, the, for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places that have been devastated. They will renew the eight ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd your flocks, foreigners will work your fields and vineyards, and you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. Thank you so much, Reuben. And can you see it's a message of renewal? Those of God's people going from mourning to joy, growing into these oaks of righteousness, end of verse three, and rebuilding all the structures of society that needs that renewing too. Well, that's our theme today. What it is to be those who are renewed and uh, our passage comes from Ephesians chapter 4. So do turn to it with me if you could. And uh, do follow uh, as we go through it so that uh, you can learn from it with us. Ephesians 4, 17 through to 24. Anyone got a Bible, a page number to give us? 1175. Thank you. And uh, you might notice that Tom actually dealt with the first paragraph a few weeks ago and we're going to read it all out again 17 through to 24 but we'll focus in on the second paragraph Ephesians 4 beginning verse 17 so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality 
so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And so says God's word. Well, the question to start with uh, this week is, uh, are you the real deal in terms of being a Christian? We're finishing the series today. It's been a 12 week series. I think, I hope remembering the key points is quite easy because they've been under those three key ideas, haven't they? And I thought I'd for a little bit of interaction, have a quick test of you. I know lots of people are away. Uh, so we started with four sermons. And what were they teaching? It begins with R, that we are by creation. Anyone want to remember what it was? What are we by creation? That R at the beginning, when we think of our identity. Come on. Royal. royal. Thank you, Les. Okay, now you can't answer again. All right. So we are royal by creation. Uh, and we then looked at four that talked about what's gone wrong because of corruption. What was the R then? If we're royal by creation, what are we because of corruption? Ruined. Ruined. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, that's your chance to answer. No, no more of these Hermione Grangers in the back. Okay, so royal ruined. Uh, and then what was it that we are in Christ, these last four? We were royal by creation, ruined by corruption. What is it now in Christ? Restored. Who's that? Just to get. Oh, thank you, Paul. OK, I'm glad everyone that answered got the right answer. So we are restored in Christ. But I really hope that helps you to understand your identity. You know, when people say you are to act according to this identity or that, you can say, no, 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 no. I know in whom I believed. I am actually royal by creation. Yes, ruined by corruption, but now restored in Christ. OK, get those three points. You've got the 12 sermons in a nutshell. But we're ending on this question, are you the real deal then? You know, are you someone who actually is restored in Christ? And to understand that, we have to come to this uh, last question or this sense of identity, which is that we are renewed. So we've thought about I'm chosen, I'm adopted, I'm redeemed, but I'm also renewed. You see, if you are the real deal, there will be some evidence of that, won't there? I'm sure you've heard of fool's gold or pyrite. It's called that because it looks just like gold. And when people were going prospecting in uh, the States, uh, some would think that pyrite was real gold and they would be shown to be fools. So it's called fool's gold. But a, a quick bit of science, I went online to try and find out how to tell the difference. It's not actually that hard. <laughs> how do you tell uh, the rock's true identity? Whether it is fool's gold or real gold, well, two ways. First, real gold is soft and can be indented. Fool's gold is hard and can't be. So if you've got your ring, give a scratch when you get home, see a scratch. Authentic. And the second thing, real gold is bright and untarnished, whereas fool's gold is duller and tarnished. Now, what it struck me is that this is also true of Christians, isn't it? Or those who confess faith in Christ. If we show that we are untarnished and soft, so the truth of Christ can shape us, then we are the real deal. We show we are rightly called the children of God. But if we are tarnished, if we find ourselves hardened to the truth of Christ, then we're not. We're fool's gold. We might look a bit like the valuable children of God, but in reality, we're not at all. But in our passage, Paul is urging us to three things so that we might prove ourselves gold. And they all reflect on this idea that we can say, if we're Christians, we are renewed. Okay? What should we see then if we are, if we are the real deal? Well, first, we should be those who put off the old us. Look at verse 22. 
you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. Can you see the reason the true Christians should be different is because they're those who have accepted the gospel that teaches them to put off the person that they once were. Kids, I think this is quite hard to grasp for you if you've grown up a Christian because you think, well, hang on, I don't really have an old self. Well, your old self is the person that you would be if God hadn't brought you to faith in Jesus. You ought to put off that kind of person. Put off the identity of not being a Christian and everything that's bound up with that. Now, we've got some technical stuff to think about a little bit today. You see, the, the term put off the old self literally is to put off the old man. And I think, not old man, I suddenly pictured it as I was speaking of, you know, a bit like me with a longer beard. That's not what it means. It, it means the old person, but it's really trying to get to grips with the fact that actually, in one sense, there are only two people that have ever lived, Adam and Christ. And, and someone said, uh, you know, everyone who's ever lived is either hanging on the belt of Adam or hanging on the belt of Christ. And if you're hanging on the belt of Adam, then when Adam goes and what's bound up with him, that will be your experience. But if you're hanging on the belt of Christ, then where he goes and what he's experienced, well, that will be yours. And so there's something theological about this idea of putting off the old man. What Paul is saying is he's saying, put off the Adamic you, yeah? You know, the you that's been descended from this person who first with his wife sinned, with all its corruption, with all its wrong desires, put that off. And we can see something of what the old man, the Adamic you and me is like from verses 18 to 19. Have a look at them and just compare them to yourself to see if you're fool's gold or real gold. So. First, verse 18, the old man is someone who has darkened thoughts. So that's you. If what you find in your mind is you're constantly thinking about what is bad and foolish. Second, verse 18, that's the, the one who has a hard heart. So that's you. If you have a stubborn will that you will just refuse to accept what God wants. So yeah, you might come to church, you might talk the talk, but when it comes to what God wants and it goes against what you want, you're hardened to it. You won't go with it. Thirdly, verse 19, the old man is one who has an unrestrained life. Can you see that? So this is you if you just go after whatever you desire, whether it's in real life or your online life. You find yourself just greedy for what's impure and sensual. Paul's saying, look, if you're the real deal, if you're a real Christian, you're someone who's put off that you, that Adamic identity, all right? That's no longer who you are. You need to understand that that you died in Jesus on the cross at Calvary 2,000 years ago. That you was drowned in your baptism under that water. is gone. It's such powerful, wonderful truth in this, isn't it? To say that you, with all your regrets and all your guilt and all that kind of stuff, is gone. It's killed off. It's behind you. Put it off. So our, our old self, our old man, is about who we belong to, but it's also about how we now live. You see, it is that once-off decision when you become a Christian, uh, pictured in your baptism. So you're saying at that point, aren't you, I'm putting off the me that I've been up to this point. But it's also a daily decision, too, because verse 22, that old you is still kind of hovering around inside. Still ruined by corruption, by those deceitful desires. And that should mean that when you feel the battle, do you? I mean, I hope I'm not the only one that feels a battle inside me constantly with sin. But actually encourage us because it feels someone at times like, doesn't it? Like there's two us's inside. Robert Louis Stevenson got this when he wrote Jekyll and Hyde. He said, uh, I called him Je in Jekyll and Hyde. I could as well have called him Robert Louis Stevenson. He got the fact that actually as a Christian, we have the old Adamic us and the new Christ us both inside us. And so, yes, we've decisively put off the old man when we are converted, but we need to daily put him off as well. And that's a daily fight that will go on until the day of our death or when Jesus comes back. Now, I think for a moment of uh, how your clothes change as you grow up. I was showing this with Afida at lunchtime because she's gone upstairs. They wanted to miss out on a good illustration. So let me, if I can, picture 
John Hobbs in the 1980s, all right? So I was born in 1970, so late 80s, I was a teenager. Uh, so I had a, a big mullet haircut at the back, short at the sides, and a huge fringe that I bleached with sun in. Uh, I told my mom it was just the sun that did it, but really I'd, I'd done it myself. I used to wear pale blue jeans, a white cardigan. Okay, any of you back in the 80s, you'll know that this was really the height of fashion. Uh, and, and pastel shirt, so pink or sort of light, lilac, done up to the top, you know, and a big gold chain. Uh, down like this, Sally, you know, you can remember these times, okay. So I was, I was actually, or so I thought I was quite cool, all right. But as I moved into the 90s, I grew up and I realised that that wasn't so cool. Um, you know, as you can see, I've obviously learned a lot about dress since then. So um, I put off the old me, I stopped dressing in that way. But of course, there's still the temptation, isn't there, to get out, you know, the white cardigan or the gold chain, you know, the old accessories. But I had to keep resisting that because I'd moved on and I had to keep putting those off as well. Now, look, I know it's a silly illustration, but if you remember it, then it works, doesn't it? But this is what we're being urged to here. And when you became a Christian, you had that decisive decision that I'm going to put off my old self like clothes. I'm no longer going to live that way. And then you've got the daily decision whenever you're tempted to put on a bit of the old person to say, no, 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 I'm not going to do that anymore. Now, I would say to you that there are times when I've been faced with a sin where I have literally verbalized this to myself. And I've said, no, I'm not going to do this, Lord. I'm not going to do this because that's not who I am anymore. I find that quite helpful. But that's what we're being told about here. So to put off the old self, you can get late 1980s fashion out of your mind now. Second, we are to be renewed, verse 23. So it's one thing to follow fashion, isn't it? It's another to have good taste. So we need someone to tell us the best way to live. Well, that's what verse 23 is about. Learning the best way to dress. We are to be made new in the attitude of our minds. Now, it can be a bit dull to get into grammar in sermons, but that the tense in the original language of the putting off is what we call an aorist tense. It's a sort of once off, like a, a full stop, a punctilia thing. So to put off the old self, that's something you do decisively when you become a Christian or those key points when you're faced with sin, you put it off. But this tense for being renewed is what they call a present continuous. So it's an ongoing thing. It's happening all the time. So the renewal of the attitude of our minds, this is a process. And it's what we call passive. So it's something being done to us, not by us. Can you see that there in verse 23? Be made new. So give yourself to the other who's making you new to God. Now, an illustration of this, I thought, was the dentist. So when I go to the dentist, I'm sure it's the same for you. You know, you go up the stairs, you sit yourself with trepidation in the chair, you lean back, you open your mouth, and it's done to you. So you are passive, you're opening your mouth. So you are allowing yourself to have the work done. Verse 23 is saying it's rather like that. We actively give ourselves to God doing something to us. We open not our mouths, we open our minds so that he might renew them. And he might do that at the level of what's called attitude here. Now, it's worth thinking about what exactly that means, because it seems that the renewal isn't simply that we gain lots and lots of knowledge. Is something else that's going on to be renewed in the attitude of our minds. I think verse 18 helps us. If you look back to it, can you see what's going on with the mind there? So the old us was darkened in thinking. Why? Well, because of the hardness of the heart. So the attitude of us with our old self was one of stubborn refusal to accept God's word and his truth. So the attitude of the mind here in verse 23 is the opposite of that. It's God actually changing uh, our heart-mind relations so that our attitude to his word and his truth is one of eager acceptance, you see. I think this is very clear in Romans 12, too. You might know the verse. Paul writes, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. 
He says, so our attitude is changed so that when we're faced with God's will and what comes in the Bible and what you hear at church and in groups, you think, yeah, that's really good. I, I want to live by that. So we are to give ourselves to God's making us more and more eager and accepting of his ways so that we're going to happily embrace them. And salt for you guys, teens. Um, another word for you, you know, and for those of you that are new Christians, is that because this is a process, you're going to find you get better at it as you go on in a Christian life. So when you're first a Christian or when you're young, you're not often quite as accepting, a bit more sceptical. But as you grow and God renews the attitude of your mind more and more, you're more and more accepting and embracing of God's truth you become. Psalm 19 tells us that God's word is like honey. Now, if you've never had honey and I tell you honey is lovely and sweet, you might take it on my word that it is. But when you first taste honey for yourself, you become much more convinced. If you don't like honey, think chocolate, okay, or something like that instead. It's like this with, with, with God's word. So I can stand up here forever and keep telling you it's really good for you, it's beneficial, and I hope you'll take that, you know, because I'm telling you that. But when you live by it, you start to taste it. And so more and more and more, God renews your mind and its attitude so that you are, well, you're someone who wants to put that word on your toast every morning and eat it down, you know, to be transformed by it. So let me ask you before we move on to our final point. What is your attitude to God's word? You know, does it show that you are the real deal, that you are someone who's put off the old man and you're being renewed in the attitude of your mind? Do you read the Bible because you must or because you long to, because you see it as precious and sweet? Well, if you don't, Paul says, look to the Lord, because he's the one who changes the attitude of your mind. You see, you can't just sort of rustle it up of yourself. It's all of him. So pray to him, pray, Lord, would you give me a real hunger for your word, a real delight in it? And he'll do that. And kids, he'll do that more and more for you as you get older and older. Just keep asking him to. And you'll start to taste that it is, in fact, sweet and it is, in fact, good. So the real deal is someone who's put off the old self, is being renewed, and who puts on the new you. Verse 24. Put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Again, the new man. Now, it's about who we belong to. So here, in the wider letter, the new man is Christ and the church as his body. So in chapter 4, uh, you get, oh no, chapter 2, verse 15, you get this idea of Jewish Christians and non-Jewish Christians coming together and it says they've become one new man, created a new man in Christ Jesus. So that's a, a behind what's going on here. But it's not just a, a corporate together thing, but it's actually a, a more specific individual thing as well. Have a look at chapter 2, verse 10. Just a page back, chapter 2, verse 10. What a great verse if you're a Christian. We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So when God, in Paul, is saying, look, put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness, he's saying, put on all that the church is destined to be, to be like God, and that you have been recreated inwardly to be as well. And so we're kind of back at the beginning of our sermon series, aren't we? Where we were royal by creation. We were to image God by ruling over the world in a way that was like him. And that's got ruined, but now it's being restored. God's remaking us in the image of God so that we might rule over the world again. He's doing it for us corporately, but he's doing it for us individually as well. So back to chapter 4, verse 24, let's think of some illustrations to help us into this. So think of a, an inner compass, all right, you know, a compass that should always point north, but it's broken. It's always pointing, well, anywhere but where it should. 
And so you take it to the Mendes and they fix it. So now it is pointing north as it was supposed to point. We have a compass spiritually inside us. And because of sin, it always points away from the Lord to what pleases us, to sin and self. But when we are converted, the Spirit of God recreates our inner, our inner self, our heart. And if you like, redirects the compass to the point it should be pointing to, to the Lord. So now our instinct is to move towards him in love and faith and obedience rather than away from him in sin and selfishness and unbelief. The compass. But maybe this one works for you. Ever seen Inside Out? kind of fun film isn't it and I love it because you've got this idea of the control room inside the person and you've got these different characters so you've got anger and disgust from people and they're all influencing how the little girl's going to live and you've got joy as well and she's a good influence on it there's a little bit of a crisis about whether she's going to continue to be that but there's something can I say a little thing that's true about this not a lot but a little bit about it and that is that inside us that's where the the real us is in control, the inner you. And before we're Christians, that inner us is a rebellious us that doesn't want the Lord. And marvelously, when God calls you to his son, he recreates that inner you. It's like that inner you dies and rises again as a new person. And now they're going to take charge of that control room of your heart and mind in a way that actually is going to conform to the likeness of God that we see in Christ. And so we're to put on the new man, the new identity as a decisive decision when we become Christians. That new us that rose with Jesus from the grave as he did, that came out of the waters of our baptism. But it's also a daily decision as well, isn't it? Perhaps a final illustration I, I thought of that helps is you could think of yourself, not very flattering, but like a broken laptop. You know, when you're converted, God puts in a new operating system in your heart. Okay, I'm speaking to the techie people here now. Now, with a new operating system, what that does, it updates all the software that's on there. That's what's going on throughout your life. And then in the resurrection, actually, you're given the new parts as a laptop as well that you need. But that's what's really going on here. And what it means that we have been renewed at conversion, we are being renewed more and more with each day, and we will be renewed fully when we die or Christ returns. And the process of our life then is taking the new us and letting that new us, like that operating system updating the software, update every different aspect of our living. So I put on the new me in the way I am at school, kids, or the way I'm at my office, or the way I am with my neighbours, or the, the things I look at online, or what I, 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 I do when uh, there's a point of tension with someone I know. You let that new you that's within you now change all the different parts of your life. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, which has been used for hundreds of years, it puts it really helpfully here that in conversion, God persuades and enables us to embrace Jesus Christ, freely offered to us in the gospel. But then we are renewed in the whole man, that is the whole person after the image of God. So what's going on in our life is bit by bit, every different part of our lives is being brought in line with the new us that's deep within Well, I know that when I was a teenager, I liked to dress like my favorite celebrity. Um, it doesn't change, actually, as adults. So there is now this thing called the Kate effect. So when Kate Middleton, now uh, Duchess of Cambridge, um, wears a dress, it, um, it, it's bought and sold out by the end of the day because everyone wants to look like her. I say everyone, half the population uh, wants to look like her. But I think we can think on growing in godliness a bit like that. Elsewhere, Paul talks about how the glory of God, the excellence of God is displayed in Jesus like in a mirror. And the idea of our being renewed day by day is that we look at Jesus. We look at him in this mirror. We see what he's like. 
uh, and we then change ourselves accordingly. So as we look in the mirror of Christ, we don't change our hair, but we change our hearts. We don't straighten our tie, we straighten uh, the decisions that we're making so they're aligned with God's will. So we put on Christ at conversion, we dress like him then, but we continue to do it through life. So Paul says elsewhere, we're transformed into his image with ever increasing glory. It's what we call glorification, becoming like the glorious God. And when we're raised from the dead and our spirits are perfected, then we will fully display his likeness. But it's an exciting thing, because what it means is the life of the new creation is budding within us. The life of the not yet is now already at work. We've been resurrected inside, though we still wait for resurrection outwardly. Now, we're drawing to a close. So what should this mean for us in terms of our identity? Well, here's four points before we finish. First, we must understand our new identity in this way. We've got to be very clear that your class or your job or your gender or your ethnicity or your sexual orientation or anything else, that's not primary in understanding who you are now as a Christian. No, you need to understand that the real you is the you that you're going to be on resurrection day. God has started a work now like a planting a little oak seed that's going to become this great oak on that day. That's who you really are. Chosen by God, adopted by God, redeemed by God, now renewed by the Lord. And so rather than say, look, I'm middle class or lower class, I'm black or white or I'm gay or straight or whatever it might be, and letting those things define everything about you, some of them bad things, now you say, no, 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 what I am is I'm a chosen, adopted, redeemed, renewed child of God. I am a person who's under reconstruction to be who I'm going to be on Resurrection Day. That's primary for me. So I'm not going to let the divisions of our society, you know, be something that I own because this is who I am and I'm united with all others like that. And when I make my decisions, I'm not going to make them uh, according to those secondary ideas of identity that the world is telling me are primary. I'm going to make decisions that fit that primary sense of my identity as a child of God, you see? That's how we now need to think of ourselves. And therefore, we live in righteousness before him. So we need to understand that new identity, but we also need to think about it. We have to keep reminding ourselves of this. I love the idea that we go through the Christian life preaching to ourselves, telling ourselves the truth. So when you're tempted to be like the world, like the old self, to find yourself in its ways. You say, no, 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 that's not who I am anymore. You know, I'm now a child of God. I'm renewed. I'm a citizen of heaven. That's who I'm going to live. That's what I'm going to live by. And third, start to love your new identity. This stuff we've looked at over these weeks, it's got a bit technical at times, but it's some of the most glorious truth that we could ever think about. So learn to love it. Learn to think about who you now are in Jesus, to cherish that, to have your, the attitude of your mind renewed accordingly, recognizing that you've been restored to royalty to bear the image of God. And fourthly, then act accordingly. Kids, when you're at school, the rest of us, when we're going through life, whatever it is, let's be putting off that old us, the non-Christian us. Let's Give ourselves to the renewing of the attitude of our minds to accept God's word. And let's put on the new us, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Well, let's spend a moment, shall we? A chance for you to respond in your own quiet, in prayer or praise to the Lord, perhaps asking him to help you in these things. Perhaps repenting of ways you've been living as the old you rather than the new you. Let's have a moment to do that in the quietness.
So, Father, we thank you for all that we are in Christ, that in your great kindness you've chosen and brought us to him, adopted us as your children, redeemed us from a whole way of life and from sin and death and hell. And we thank you that you are renewing us now from glory into glory until through death and resurrection we will be fully in your image, free from all sin and imperfection to reign forever with you over this world made new for all time. Father, help us to define ourselves by these truths and not in the way the world seeks to define us. When we feel low of ourselves, when we're tempted to sin, help us to remember and delight in the fact that you have made us your own but father we do fail miserably in living up to this new identity in christ and so we do pray that you'd forgive us forgive us O oh father for all the ways in what we've said and thought and done that we seek to go back putting on aspects of the old us rather than the new us that is Christ in us. Father, please forgive us. And by the work of your spirit within us, would you please be renewing us more and more inwardly, that we might conform to your likeness and find joy in doing so. And we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, of course, we know that if we're sincere in praying for God's forgiveness, uh, he is sincere in giving it. Uh, and we're going to sing again now, Jesus paid it all, that reminds us of that, that if you're new to Christian things, in his death on the cross, Jesus paid the penalty for our sin. He took the punishment we deserve so that if we trusted him, we do not face it. And so we're fully forgiven. And that's how we made these great children of God. So let's stand, shall we, and sing, Jesus paid it all. I hear the Savior say Thy strength indeed is small Oh, praise 
Take your seats, please, everyone. Well, the way we remember that Jesus has fully paid our debts is in the Lord's Supper in communion. Uh, and that's what we do on the first Sunday of every month, uh, if you've not been with us for that before. Uh, and what's going on really is this is something that Jesus taught us to do. That the night before he died, he taught that uh, the bread was a symbol of his body that would be broken on the cross. The wine, a symbol of his blood that would be poured out there as his means of paying our debts and therefore enabling us to be forgiven and cleansed. So that as we've sung, we would be whiter than snow, even though we clearly aren't, uh, but that we would be in God's sight. And so the Apostle Paul says, whenever we eat and drink, what we're doing is we're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. We're looking back to what he did. We're looking forward to what it will ultimately mean. Now, who's it for? Well, it's for everyone that's the real deal, if you like, that, you know, a genuine Christian. So if you've been baptised and you are seeking to live according to the truths you believe, you're trusting in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you're seeking to live with him as Lord, well, please do therefore share in taking the bread and the wine with us. If that's not yet you, that's absolutely fine. Uh, what we encourage the kids who haven't been baptised or confirmed their baptismal vows to do is they can come up and uh, we've got a uh, Bible verse card in there so they can come up and they'll take one of those and take it back down you're very welcome to just come up and take one of those if you'd like to or you're very welcome to just sit where you are and reflect uh, on what's going on but the first thing we do before we receive is we affirm our faith together and uh, we commonly do this by saying what's called the Apostles' Creed which is an ancient statement of belief that Christians have uh, been saying for so long and uh, it sums up so much of what we've believed about God and of his son, Jesus. So if you can say these words with sincerity, please do join now in saying them. And after them, uh, I've added, as I've done previously, a little declaration from the book of Revelation that we can say together as well. Your bit will be in capital letters. But let's say this together. I believe in God, uh, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. But we don't just believe these things, we worship God because of them. So hear this, uh, I put it around the wrong way actually, your bit is in bold. Uh, so I say salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Let's say together, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honour and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Well, we're told in the scriptures that, uh, you know, the saints in heaven with angels and archangels say those words and we're caught up with them uh, as we worship. Let's bow our heads, shall we, uh, and say a prayer before we receive. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the gifts of creation of bread and wine, but we thank you most especially for what they point us to, Christ's death for us upon the cross. We thank you that we read that uh, it was our sin there that he bore, dying the righteous for the unrighteous to bring us to God. We thank you that there we even read that he was cursed for us so that we might escape the curse due to those who break your law. We praise you that his death is our salvation. We praise you that because of it, 
we are forgiven and given new life. And we pray, Lord, as we come now to eat and drink in a moment, uh, we pray that you give us right hearts as we do, not trusting in ourselves, not looking to any worth within us for your acceptance, but only to the blood of Christ that has paid the penalty for our sin and the righteousness of Christ that is counted as if it were ours. Father, we pray that as we look to him in heaven, you would cleanse us and feed us with his body and blood, strengthening us, that with the whole company of your people, we would one day sit and eat in his kingdom. Amen. Well, so it was that the night before he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying to them, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and when he gave thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the coming kingdom of God. Well, the way we do this is I will ask people to come up, maybe six at a time, just come around the table. Uh, if you're coming for a card, take one of those, but if not, Take a bit of bread from here and eat it, and then take one of the cups, uh, drink it, and leave it on the table so we know that's been used, uh, and then please take your seat. And there's a low alcohol, uh, uh, non alcoholic drink here as well for those who prefer that. But as uh, I call people up, do, um, do just reflect, reflect on Christ, on his body and his blood given for you. Musicians, why don't you come up first and take a seat? Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Let's stand and sing. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to hear. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I Oh, 
chains are released, I can sing, I am free and not I, but through Christ. Thank you for the gospel of Christ in us, the hope of glory. We thank you, Father, that we've heard today astonishingly that the life of the world to come is already at work within us, renewing us from glory into glory until that day when we will be utterly glorified and live forever in joy before you, filled with praise and thanksgiving. Father, as we leave, we pray that just as you go with us, you would help us to live as the people that we are in Christ, not those we once were in Adam. And so may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Great. Well, do take your seats just for a moment. Um, and to say that as always, church continues as we hang out for a little bit afterwards. We've got uh, drinks and nibbles. Uh, if you've got children, if you could encourage them to play out that way, uh, where there's grass, not that way, where there are cars, that'd be wonderful. And if you could pick them up uh, as soon as possible from upstairs, that'd be good too. But do go in God's grace, mercy and peace. And we'll see you again soon.
Okay, your macro manager, get some height and get in. Yeah, that's good. Have you seen the video of um, that Captain Dave Marquet? No, I've 
Stopping back to build the seminary, uh, all this kind of stuff. He did one like without leadership and conviction. He, he essentially did that in terms of values and stuff. I don't think that was really learned. Have you come across Sterling Leadership? The Greenwood organization of state. The very what's good about it is that it's 